Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining across many uh, different time zones. I know people have started their days early, um, staying back late. So uh, my name is Samantha Jin. I'm a senior researcher in the Gene Therapy Research Unit at the Children's Medical Research um, Institute in Sydney, Australia, and I'm the current secretary of the Australasian Gene and Cell Therapy Society and moderating this event today. So quick introduction to our society. So uh, we were the Australian, sorry, Australasian Gene Therapy Society. Uh, we were formally established in 2001 after we held our first uh, meeting in 1999. And in 2004, we formally uh, changed our name to the Australasian Gene and Cell Therapy Society. And we're relatively a small society, uh, which I guess reflects the size of the Australian gene therapy movie. So we've been holding our biennial meetings uh, since 1999, and our next meeting is planned um, for November 2024 next year. So uh, please feel free to reach out either via our website or my email there um, on the screen, um, and I'm very happy to answer your um, queries. Uh, so this is our executive committee. So we have our four um, executive positions. Uh, so Paul Gregorovic, our president, um, Jim Vidolis, our vice president, and Simpson, our treasurer, and myself, the secretary. We also have um, Steve Wilton uh, as our ex officio member and our uh, six um, committee members. Uh, so Again, thank you for joining um, this event and thank you to the um, American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy for um, co-hosting um, our first speaker, um, Dr. Marty Cavanis, um, presenting his work um, on uh, AAV uh, capsid development in the liver. Um, so Marty was born and raised in Barcelona and uh, obtained his bachelor's degree in biotechnology um, from the University of Autonoma in Barcelona. Uh, he then pursued and received his Master of Science in Applied Biotechnology from Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, he completed his master's thesis um, under the supervision of Associate Professor Rosette Luzowski uh, in the gene transfer um, field, uh, looking at targeting, sorry, in the gene transfer targeting and uh, therapeutics core at the Salk Institute in um, California. Uh, he was our first um, PhD candidate who participated in the newly formed um, UCL CMRI bridge program and worked on a joint project between the group um, of Adrian Thrasher and um, and Rochette Kozowski here at CMRI. He earned his PhD in gene therapy um, at the University of College London in 2019. And since then, he's joined um, the team here at CMRI as a postdoc developer. All right, so thanks for the opportunity to present some of our research today. My name is Marty Cabanas, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Translational Bacteriology Research Unit of the Children's Medical Research Institute in Sydney. So I've been asked to uh, share some of the work we've done uh, here in Australia during the past years on capsid development, specifically for the liver. So I'll just run you through a couple of projects that we have recently published, and I'll link those projects later on to work that we are currently uh, carrying out. Before I move on, I always like uh, to add this slide with a big picture of the research we're doing, because especially today I'll describe work that's on the area of basic understanding of AAV transaction. But I think that that is actually the key to then be able to design better capsids and then start the chain of being able to treat patients at a lower dose, which can in turn lead to improved safety, lower cost per patient, and at the end result uh, in an improved uh, health care. But, you know, as obvious as it sounds, everything starts uh, back here at the bottom. So for those of you that are not that familiar with the system, we're mainly interested in adeno-associated viruses or AV, which are small viruses that contain a genome of around 4.7 kilobases. 
And these viruses have gained track during the last years as gene therapy vectors, mainly because of the plasticity of the system. Uh, basically, the only elements that are uh, required for packaging the genome into the capsid are the inverted terminal repeats, meaning that you know, researchers can remove anything that's between um, these two inverted terminal repeats, so the rep and cap genes, and then use uh, the capsid as a delivery tool for gene therapies. As you may know, there are some products already approved. Uh, but most of them are based on wild-type capsids, which are not that efficient. So high doses are usually required. So in this sense, I really like this recent quote here by Keshimoto Tsumoski around the current efforts of our field, which are trying to provide similar efficacy of the gene therapies that are already approved, but are much lower vector doses if possible. One of the ways of doing that is by capsid engineering, which is the focus of our lab, and I'm particularly interested in the liver, as I mentioned before. So just really quickly, the essential background info that I think is required to follow the talk, for those of you that again are not that familiar with the system, the capsid gene codifies for three capsid subunits, and 60 of those subunits assemble into a symmetric capsid. And you can see here in pink regions that are more exposed or farther from the center of the capsid. Now, since many serotypes or variants have been identified in nature, regions that are more variable between those uh, natural serotypes were named a few years back as variable regions, one to nine. And the focus of the work I'll present today is on variable region one, just to map it here. And it's, this region is actually also exposed on the capsid surface. Right. So one of the historical problems with animal models of the liver and also you know, other organs is that the transaction efficiency of AB capsids varies a lot across species. So this was observed first in, in this uh, sort of work by Nathwani and colleagues um, with a variant that is named AB8. And this classical study, what we learn, I guess, is that uh, lower vector doses in murine models yielded really high transaction efficiencies, but that, that was not then carry on, on you know, non-human primates and later on on clinical trials. So there's a need, we think there's a need um, to, I guess, both understand what yields to those differences, but also a need to develop novel models that are closer to the human setting. And that is kind of the big um, you know, high-level context of the work I'll share it with you today. So one of the first models that was developed a few years back, and that is extremely useful, useful to study the human hepatotropism of AB vectors, is the a uh, FRG model where primary human hepatocytes can be engrafted in the marine liver scalpel. So the first project I'll share maps around here, and we aim to study which regions are important for murine or human transaction. And the variable region one came up as one important hit. The second project I'll share aim to study, in this case, which domains are key for human hepatocyte transaction. And again, BR1, appear as highly promising region. Um, the third project I'll share with you today was more focused on, on the model. And we took advantage of, uh, in this case, an ex situ human liver perfusion system of you know, whole human um, liver organs to study the transaction of AB variants um, that we had previously selected in the FRG model. And I'll end with some preliminary data of a project that we are currently carrying out, which is based on the knowledge that we acquire around the importance of the variable region one. All right, so the first project we studied um, a vector that was uh, published by the K-Lab Stanford called KP1, which in our hands works really well in the murine liver, as you can observe here, uh, especially when compared to AB3B. What's interesting is that KP1 is quite similar to AB3B. So the project aimed to, to kind of identify which of the 51 amino acid differences were key to improve the murine transaction of AB3B, um, which is a capsid that you know, was originally isolated from human tissue. 
So I'm not going to go into details, but after some bacteriology work, we realized that a single amino acid insertion at position 265 was highly responsible for this. You can observe here on this graph on the right that the insertion, the insertion seemed to improve the AB3 um, um, entry in urine hepatocytes in this case, but the deletion of the same position at KP1 also seemed to decrease in this case uh, the performance of KP1. And at the same time, we observe uh, this uh, functionally. So in this case, by studying the GFP, you can really see that with just one insertion at this particular position, you can go from something like this to something like this. And again, importantly, when we remove this insertion from KP1, um, there was clearly uh, a deficit in, in the expression of the GFP in this case. Perhaps more importantly, we then moved also this insertion into other AB variants. In this case, AB variants that we had previously isolated directly from the human liver, which you can see they don't work at all in the marine liver. Um, and in this case, uh, this was the fact that we observed. So this mechanism seems to be quite transitional too. We still do not understand the mechanism. And I know the K lab is also doing some work on this now. But precisely this region can be found on the interface between the structure of AB and the AB receptor. So perhaps a better interaction with the murine ABR could be a possible explanation. So as I mentioned before, here at CMRI, we're actually extremely lucky because we have access to this Xenograph mouse model, which contains both human and mouse hepatocytes in the marine liver scaffold. So we end up with uh, these chimeric animals, where if you take a liver cross-section, what you end up seeing is primary human hepatocytes, which are marked here in red, uh, growing in these sort of uh, clusters in the marine liver scaffold. So this is the second study. Um, here, what we did is we generated a DNA family shuffling library containing parentals uh, AB1 to 12. And we selected these libraries. It's just like a pool of millions of different variants in human hepatocytes that are present in the FRG model. And our hypothesis here was that regions that were important for this human hepatocyte transaction should be actually strongly positively selected. And after a few rounds of selection, we isolated a few novel variants that we named AB Sydney or AB Seeds. And when we tested these variants uh, together with few controls in the hepatocytes, again, present in the FRG model, we realized that all of those variants that work really well, which are marked here with an asterisk, actually share the variable region in this case from AB2 or AB3, the variable region one, which again suggested that this, you know, again, there was a strong positive selection for this particular region. So when we tested in the same FRG mouse, um, AB CD12 encoding for Venus and AB8 encoding for cerulean, and here again, human hepatocytes are marked in red with GAPTH, you can appreciate that this shuffle variant was able to you know, pretty much co-localize with the human hepatocytes. And with this gather information, I guess, we decided to then test the potency of the variable region one from AB2 into AB7. So we generated this swap variant, which contains pretty much all the capsid region from AB7, except for BR1, which comes from AB2. And again, we package this uh, variant in Venus, this one in cerulean, and we tested them in the same FRG mode, in the animal in this case. And you can see again that just by changing the BR1, uh, we dramatically increase the transactional potential of AB7. Again, uh, working really well now in this particular model. Um, however, there's always um, the doubt in our field on whether the FRG model is predictive or not of the performance uh, in a human liver. Because till now, there was really no way to test this until getting into clinical trials. So during the last couple of years, our effort together with a group of fantastic surgeons at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital uh, here in Sydney has been to develop 
and validate a new model for assessing AB transaction, which is based on whole human uh, liver experiments in this case. So the main idea here, and I presented this data back in, um, in 2022 at the ASGCT, um, is that we were able to modify a perfusion system to prolong the perfusion at 36 degrees for periods of around one week up to 13 days. Um, and here you can see an example of one of the labors that we did where we injected ICG, which is uh, fluorophore typically used uh, during surgeries, just to check how uh, the perfusion is going. And you can see that you know under a minute, everything is, is pretty much uh, perfused. So the idea here is that we took a set of uh, naturally occurring uh, AVs that have been tested before in clinical trials, as well as few of our bioengineered variants, including the AVC variants I mentioned before, and we generated, uh, in this case, a barcoli mix. So we packaged these sort of barcoli transgenes into each of the capsids. Um, and you know what's cool, I guess, is that obviously these livers harbor immune resident cells. So we evaluate, evaluated the same AB mix uh, on two different human livers. One where we use uh, plasma that was reactive to some of the AB variants and one where we use non-reactive plasma. And then we evaluated the relative performance across a week. So there's a lot of data that you can find in our uh, recent preprint, but basically with the non-reactive conditions, which are these ones in here, um, AEB, Sydney 12, and LKO3 uh, work really well. And it's important to remember is that actually these two variants were actually uh, developed in the humanized FRG model. Um, other variants didn't work that well, for example, AB5, um, although we observe some entry, which is here on the DNA reads, we didn't really observe any uh, signs of expression, at least at the dose that we uh, observe. And again, we need to remember that these are relative performance. So if a variant performs really well, uh, the other ones are going to appear a bit lower. Um, these then are the same vectors, but in this case tested in a different human liver where we use plasma that was reactive mainly to AV2 and AV3B like capsids, as well as the AVC capsids. As you can observe here, we saw almost a complete neutralization for those reactive variants. Uh, remember that again, CD12 and LK3, for example, work pretty well under non-reactive conditions. And in this case, we didn't observe my, many of the reads mapping to LK3 or CD12. And that was even more evident at the functional level in this case. So obviously this was just the first application uh, of the model, but we think it could be great, uh, for example, to study a uh, vector induced toxicity or vector doses in the future. And I'm gonna finish uh, with another application of this model, which is using it for directed evolution experiments, aiming to generate novel capsids for the human liver. So putting together with the knowledge that we have accumulated from the past years, um, you know, given the potency that we have observed for the variable region one, we decided to generate a library focusing only on this particular region. So again, I'm not gonna go into much detail, but basically what we did was aligning the capsid region of a set of naturally occurring variants that are shown in here. Um, and then we took a look at the variable region one. And whenever a position in this case had 100% identity on all those AVs, we left it untouched. For example, these ones in here. Um, whenever two possibilities were possible, we created variants containing either of, of those. For example, this position here would contain either uh, serine or threonine. And then, um, you know, whenever there was more than two positions available, uh, we also, um, you know, generated, uh, I guess, uh, more variability at these particular positions. For example, this one in here. At the end, we had a limited number of around 15,000 variants, and we built this library onto the scaffold of AVC 11 and the HSPGD targeted uh, AV LQ3 variant. 
So this represents the schematic of the selection process. So really quickly again, we took the library initially, we selected in the liver excellent model and also in FRGs with the presence or absence of human IBIG. We ranked the variants um, and then we perform a secondary library selection on the same models until we identify our top candidates. And by now we have only some preliminary data in the FRG model. So basically what we did is we took these um, candidates and generated our coding mix and co-injected in this case, three FRGs again with the presence or ab absence of the IVAG. Um, the results here are normalized to ABCD11, which is displayed as a one. And you can see that without a VAG, some candidates uh, work slightly better, but the main difference was in the animals that were passively immunized with IVAG. And so, you know, we're still validating these new capsids, but if we focus on CIN11 and, for example, this secondary candidate one, which show like a five-fold improvement uh, under the IVAG condition, um, this is what occurs with CIN11 and five milligrams of IVAG. So we observe pretty much a complete blocking um, of the transaction. So just few um, GFP positive cells on the um, human uh, clusters. And whereas with this novel variant at the same dose, uh, we still observe some transaction. And interestingly, interestingly too, um, we observe transaction of murine hepatocytes. And again, this is just with a minimal change in the variable region one. So as a summary, I've shown you that a single amino acid insertion at the VR1 can dramatically increase the marine function of human um, hepatotropic uh, capsids. And that precisely this same region was highly selected for in the novel variants and ABC new variants that we described a couple of years back. Then I've shared some of our current efforts validating, validating a new model uh, of the human liver based on whole human liver explants. And I finish with the library selection precisely in this model um, that has yielded this novel variant. Um, so I guess I hope I could give you overall uh, a glimpse of some of the liver directed gene therapy work that we're carrying out here in Australia. And lastly, I'd just like to thank everyone that was involved in this project throughout the last years, uh, especially the members of the unit led, led by Leszek Grzyzowski, uh, which obviously without them, all this work wouldn't have been possible. I'd like to thank also uh, members from Ian Alexander's uh, group, especially Cindy Zhu, which is doing pretty much all the mouse work um, that I've presented today, and also the group of surgeons led by Carlo Politano. Uh, which are taking care of the human liver expert work. Um, I guess thank also our funding bodies, and I'll be happy to take any questions later on if there are. Thank you. Dr. Livia Carvajalo. Uh, uh, I won't introduce um, her title, but um, uh, Livia is a senior lecturer with a joint appointment at the University of Western Australia and the Lions Eye Institute in Perth, Western Australia. Her research institute interests have always been in the field of vision science and covers a range of expertise, including evolution of colour vision and translational gene therapy approaches for inherited blindness. Uh, she holds a Master's of Science in Neuroscience and a PhD Genetics from the University of College London and International Postdoctoral Training into Retinal Disorders and Ocular Gene Therapy at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology uh, and the Shepherd's Eye Research Institute at Harvard Medical School in Boston. In 2015, um, Livia relocated to Perth uh, in Australia under an ARC DECRA fellowship to establish her own group uh, the Retinal Genomics and Therapy Group at the Lions Eye Institute. Um, as you've heard, her research focuses on creating research platforms in the area of AAV gene therapy and neuroprotective treatments for inherited, inherited retinal diseases alongside understanding the basic and cellular molecular mechanisms behind, behind vision loss, uh, cell death mechanisms and retinal development. 
um, Dr. Carvalho had presented her work on several international meetings, including ARVO, uh, the International Symposium on Retinal Degeneration, and the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. Uh, and she is a committee member of the Australasian Gene and Cell Therapy Society and an Australasian Vision Research Foundation Review Board member. So welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Livia Carvalho and I'll first like to thank you the ASGCT and the AGCT, AGCTS um, for inviting me to take part of this virtual symposium um, talking about gene and cell therapy around the world and this session is focusing in Australia. So today I'll be talking about the preclinical efficacy testing of an AV based gene therapy for KCNV2 deficiency that my team has been working on in the last few years. So the deficiency we're looking at, the KCNV2 retinopathy, it's a type of inherited retinal disease, or IRD. An IRD is a broad group of diseases um, which can be caused by mutations in, in uh, over 260 genes identified so far. They've got a lot of clinical um, uh, phenotypes associated with it, so it can be quite variable in terms of age of onset, how it presents, um, and as you can see from this graph, the amount of uh, genes that involved um, is, is quite large. And even within each gene, different mutations can have different um, presentations. The one that we'll be talking about in this presentation is called a case, KCNV2 retinopathy. So it's mutations in the KCNV2 gene, which is part of the broader cone rod dystrophy. It also can be called cone rod dystrophy with supernormal rod response, CDSRR. And I'll go a little bit um, into why this was um, initially called um, this, because it's related to the phenotype. So what's the clinical presentation of the KCNV2 retinopathy? Um, it was first described in 83 uh, by Gores and Associates, but the gene itself that causes um, this particular disease wasn't um, discovered or wasn't reported until 2006, and it was shown to be the KCNV2 gene, and it's called by inherited, uh, recessive inherited uh, mutations in this gene. So it, got, it has a var variable age of onset, usually infancy or early childhood, um, and it presents with reduced visual acuity, abnormal color vision, and impaired adaptation to different light conditions. So it has different impacts of how the patients um, see, um, well, how their vision presents, and also how they react to different light intensities. The graphs here at the bottom is just showing that you can get a little bit of a variation um, on the grading of the disease, um, in terms of how severe it presents. It does have a correlation with age, um, but as, as, as the, the more severe patients tend to present in the older groups, but it, it is um, a little bit variable as well between patients. So what is KCNV2? Um, so KCNV2 encodes a voltage-gated potassium channel subunit KV8.2, which is considered a electrically silent voltage-gated potassium subunit. Um, so this, it's called electrically silent because it doesn't form a channel on its own. It needs to assemble with KV2 subunits um, to form these functional channels. So in the retina, which is uh, the, the tissue at the back of the eye, um, which is where light and vision um, starts, um, the KCNV2 or the KV8.2 subunit, it co-partners with the KV2.1 or the KV2.2 um, in, in, in patients. And it's responsible for setting the dark ionic current in the photoreceptor cells, which are responsible, the first neurons responsible for your light transduction uh, pathway. So these channels are very important because they help modulate the, uh, the influx and influx of uh, potassium within these cells and keeps that current um, stable in the dark and how it reacts to light so that the visual process can happen normally. So it's very important part of your visual processing. So what is the supernormal rod response that I had mentioned previously? And it's unique and diagnostic for this condition. No other inherited retinal disease uh, presents with this type of uh, response. And this is associated with the electrical response of these photoreceptor cells that I've just mentioned, which is something that we can measure uh, quite non-invasively, both in patients and in potentially animal models of diseases using what we call an electroretinogram. So this is the response of some patients and the normal subject. Um, you have a normal subject here responding to different light intensities. And as the intensity goes up, the response goes up. There's different components to this response, and I'll go into what they are a little bit later. As, as you can see in the dark adapted 
um, response. The patients initially start with a very um, small response, but as soon as you start um, going up in the light intensity, their response becomes what we call abnormal or supernormal. So it's a much higher um, response and amplitude um, compared to a normal patient. This is their light adapted response, and that abnormal response isn't actually seen in their light adapted, which is your daylight vision cells. This is your night vision cells. Um, they only have a reduced response in the daylight vision compared to a normal subject. So this supernormal response is only seen on that dark um, adapted process, but it is unique to this condition um, and it's linked to its physiology of the disease. So the first step for us working with this condition was to validate a knockout uh, model. So we were the first group in the world to uh, validate the KD8.2 knockout mouse model. This is a complete knockout. And we've looked at both six months, two months and six months um, to try to chart a little bit of the disease process. Um, we can see here that uh, the animal, this is a wild type retina at the back of the eye where you can get expression of the KV 8.2, um, co-partnering very nicely with the KV 2.1, um, where it should be in the, in the segments of these cells, in the outer segments, what we call them. And this is looking, we looked at both the KV 8.2 knockout and the KV 2.1 knockout mice to compare. Um, and you can see that in the KV 8.2, the 2.1 subunit is still being expressed because this subunit can form a channel on its own, but the 8.2 subunit that's knocked out is not being expressed. While on the 2.1 knockout, both subunits don't actually come together and not expressed because the 8.2 is not capable of forming a channel on its own. So the expression actually gets reduced once you don't have the 2.1. Um, we looked at... Um, Expression of this is just confirming that our knockout is indeed a knockout. There is no KB8.2 expression. It shows a reduction on the 2.1 expression as well in the knockout. Um, but obviously our gene is absent. This is looking at tunnel positive cells. So looking a little bit at the death process and it shows that there's a bit of a peak in our model um, around the one month, um, but that comes down, but still stays significant compared to wild type at the three months and six months of age. So there is a progression, progressive cell uh, loss. This is looking at the urta nuclear layer thickness, which is this layer here, which is where our cells that express um, these subunits are located. And this is just comparing central to periphery loss as well, showing that um, we're losing cells obviously um, more centrally than periphery um, in our model. This is when we looked at the six month stage. You can still see that we, there has been cell loss compared to wild type. This is the outer nuclear layer over here, um, but we still have quite a lot of the cells there, which is giving us hope that there is um, a potential to rescue these cells. And this is reflected on the quantification. When we look at this electroretinogram response of these animals, um, we can see that on the light adapted, so what we call the photopic, um, this is what a wild type response looks like. And we've got a, a severe reduction in both the models that we looked. This is quantification of what we call the A wave and the B wave. The A wave is this negative wave and the B wave is the positive wave. And you can see that they're very severely reduced in our knockout model. And this is a behavioral assessment of visual um, reflex. And that's also reduced um, in our knockout model. So then does the mouse have the supernormal uh, wave, uh, dark adapted wave response? And we were quite happy to see that it was. So similar to the patient, we were seeing a supernormal response. So this is the ERG for the dark adapted response, the electrophysiology response. So you've got what we call the A wave here, which is your negative response. And then your B wave is your positive component of that response. Normally, when you're assessing the amplitude of these responses to quantify it, your A wave is measured from baseline to the base of the trough, while your B wave is measured from the base of the A to the top of the B. So you get an amplitude which is reflective of both responses. These responses are linked in a normal, um, a normal, you know, a normal patient and a normal mouse. So the, the, how well the A wave responds is going to give an indication of how well the B will respond as well. In our mouse, this response is not as linked. We're not quite sure yet why, but you can see the reduction of our A, A wave, um, and then you can see the supernormal um, response of our B wave. However, to quantify that supernormal response, we had to do the analysis slightly differently. We have to do what we call the positive B wave, which is from the base to the, the baseline to the top of the B wave. Because when we quantified using the full normal B wave, 
because the A wave is reduced, we weren't really seeing um, a, a difference between the models. This is shown here. We only see a bit of a significant difference towards the end, um, the light intensities, um, but it wasn't really reflecting this supernormal wave that we were seeing. When we look at the positive B wave, as you can see here, you get your wild type here and um, our mutant um, is here at the top and it's um, significantly enhanced. So we also looked at the visual acuity and um, contrast sensitivity, again, the visual behavior reflex um, in these animals. And you can see a huge reduction on the acuity and the contrast sensitivity of these animals. So having this supernormal response doesn't mean their vision is actually better. On the contrary, it's actually worse. So the next step for us was looking at um, the gene therapy. So how how, how well can we try to uh, rescue this condition using gene therapy in this um, in our model? So first is the gene therapy checklist, if you may, um, and we're looking at a monogenic disorder with a known gene, so that was good. Um, the disease has a fairly slow progression, both in the patients and in our model, it means that we've got cells there that can receive the therapy, so it's got a bigger window for intervention. Um, we've got a validated mouse model, and we've got a small gene that can actually fit into the AV um, vector. So we had our checklist done for the gene therapy and we started uh, progressing in um, moving that forward. So our design for our therapy, um, we looked into, first we have to do a subretinal delivery, which is a delivery here in the back of the eye in what we call the subretinal space between the, the, the layer where the cells we're trying to target, the photoreceptors, and the cells adjacent to it, which is your RPE cell. So we have to create a little bleb there, inject our virus, um, and that gets resolved. And then the virus is able to actually target the right cells. So it has to have that subrenal delivery because that's the only way to target these photoreceptor cells efficiently. We, were com we wanted to compare two different serotypes, which we know work well for these photoreceptor cells, the AV8 and the ANK80 serotypes. And we also wanted to do a bit of a dose escalation. And we went from one in nine vector genomes up to five and nine vector genomes to see whether there was a dose dependent effect on the therapy. So our outcome measures, uh, we were looking at uh, four, eight and 12 weeks post-treatment. Uh, mo majority of our measures were looking at this ERG profile based on the disease has that unique electroretinogram uh, response, which is the ERG. And we were looking at quantifying the A wave, the positive B wave, oscillatory potential and C waves, which are other measures of part of this response as well. We also wanted to look at behavioral visual response. We know that that was reduced, or the acuity and the contrast in these mice. Can we recover that after treatment? And also looking at the CKVC and B2 gene expression and protein expression and metamorphization. Is it being expressed in the right place? Is it co partnering with KV2.1? So this is just to go over the ERG profile that we're looking at and what's, um, what's behind it. So this is, as i shown before, this is what an ERG wave look like. Um, these are the different retinal cells that are form part of this response. And the first step of the response is this negative response, which is the A wave. And that's mediated by your photoreceptor cells, your cones and your rods, which is where KCNV2 is expressed. Then that's followed by your B wave, which comes as a response to your activation of your photoreceptors that then activate your bipolar cells and your mulaglia. So it's a measure, it's a combination of these two cells. And then you've got your C wave much later on, which is mulaglia in your RPE cells that are responding to extracellular potassium levels. So we thought it was actually important for us to look at C wave as well, given that these are potassium channels. And as part of that, we've got also what we call the oscillatory potentials, which are these peaks here, which we can subtract from this response and iso sorry, and look in isolation. And there's a measure of your inner nuclear layer cells as well and how well they're responding in response to your photoreceptors responding to light. So these are the different measures that we will be looking at. So the serotype comparison, <clears throat> we decided to go with AV8 and ANKT because they're both known to target photoreceptors quite well. Um, I'm a little biased because I characterized the ANKT in the retina and I sh we shown that it was actually outperforming AV8 after subretinal delivery. So it seems to turn on a little bit faster and have a and, and have a little bit of a stronger expression in your photoreceptor, the cells over here, compared to AV8. Um, that um, potentially levels out with time, but does it mean that if, if you've got a faster vector with a higher transgene expression, potentially, is it going to be a better vector for your therapy? 
So we did our injections and we started looking at our animals. We've done a, quite a few different um, variations of the injections. The majority of the data I'm showing were done with animals injected at 30 days of age, and we evaluated them at four, eight, and 12 weeks. So this is the scotopic, the dark ERG response. And this is what the traces look like. This is our wild type mice. This is our untreated 8.2 knockout with a supernormal wave, a reduced A wave. These are our three treated groups. So we've got our Ankati at a titer of three to the nine. We've got AV8 at the same titer of three to the nine. And then we also did an AV8 at a higher titer of five to the nine. So this is just what the traces start to look like as an um, example trace from our groups. And this is a quantification of the ERG. So first, this is the A wave. Um, you can even see with the wild type here, um, this is negative. So it's obviously, it's increasing with light intensity. And you can see that our, um, our treated animals, um, as you increase with intensity, um, our NKT and our high dose AV8 start to show some nice, nice significant compared to the untreated. It's still significant compared to the wild type, but it, it is veering away from the untreated response, which is the light blue here. When we look at weeks post-treatment in our four, eight and 12 weeks, that's pretty consistent. Um, that the, even the response we were getting at four weeks was uh, already quite quite similar to what we were getting at 12 and it was seems to be consistent and staying, um, that response was staying at 12. Again, ankating and AV8 high dose was showing um, a, a bigger, as a, was showing significance compared to the untreated. The B wave, positive B wave, um, we've got a, a much nicer result in the sense that um, the results were much closer to wild type. And all three groups had showed quite nice significance across the, the different light intensities we tested. And also over time as well, that's pretty consistent. So they're all significant compared to the untreated. So we also looked at whether we could, this long-term improvement in this um, could be seen. And to do that, we also looked at what we call the B wave to A wave ratio. So the, as, as I said, the A wave is linked, sorry, the B wave is linked to an A wave response. So um, looking at the ratio between the two gives us a good indication of how well these retinas are responding. These are our mice that were treated at 30 days, looking at 12 days post-treatment, 12 weeks, sorry, post-treatment. Um, this is the wild type ratio, which is just a 1.5 around. Our uh, ratio is much higher in our untreated, given this supernormal wave. But we can see a nice reduction coming down from all our treated groups as well, which are still significant, are very significant compared to the untreated. We also looked at animals treated at six months of age at 12 weeks post-treatment. And we can see that that ratio as well is still significant. It's still coming down in all three groups. So even when we treat much later in disease, we can still improve that. Um, and also we have a group where we treated that 30 days, but we looked at six months post-treatment, so not just 12 weeks. Um, and that was just done with the high dose AV8. And we can see that we can still have a significant AB to E wave uh, ratio happening in that group. So we're still seeing an effect of that treatment, whether we treat late uh, or whether we um, have a long-term treatment. So one thing we noticed in that, um, in our scotopic dark response is that the A wave was having a bit of an improvement in its shape. So you can see here, you get a very sharp peak and then you get what we call the OPs coming up quite, um, quite close and quite quickly. In our knockout model, you've got a much broader peak and, um, and this kind of second dip which we don't see as much here in the wild type. But after treatment, we start to see an improvement um, of that shape. And that is reflected quite nicely in our OPs, which we extracted from that wave. And you can see here in the wild type, you get, um, this is a, the first response to light, and then you get OP1, 2, and 3. Um, and that OP1 is much delayed in our uninjected uh, mice. But after the treatment, we were able to recover that delay, and this is when we quantify implicit time, and we're basically bringing that timing of that response back to wild type level. This is reflecting the inner nuclear layer neurons that are responding, the photoreceptors responding to light, actually having a much better uh, physiological response. We also looked at, as I mentioned, to the C wave, which is a response of mainly of your RPE cells to extracellular potassium. You've got a very nice C wave coming up on your wild type, and it's much reduced in our models we start to see a recovery of that wave um, in our, but all, all our three um, treated. Um, the amplitude was only significant in our eight uh, NKT and the high dose AV8. But when you look at what we call the positive C wave, again, from the base here, 
all three groups are significant. And also the timing of that peak of that C wave was significant um, um, in all three groups, in, improved compared to the untreated. So the next step is, can we recover this on the visual testing uh, behavior? So we just recall what we do, the optomotor response. Um, and that's basically you put a mice in a little pedestal and it's surrounded by four screens with black and white bars that move in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. And the mice track that movement. We've got a camera here at the top that tracks the mice tracking the head uh, movement of the mice. And we can quantify whether it actually sees the movement of the bars. And you can change the contrast of these bars or the acuity, which is the, the thickness of the bars. So this is just a short video showing what, what it looks like from the camera. Those are the bars and you can see the mice actually um, tracking that movement. And that's recorded automatically by the software, whether they have a positive tracking or not, and um, if they're responding better. So when we looked at our treatment, both, at, both the groups treated at 30 days or six months, we had this uh, fairly nice um, improvement of the, of the optometry response where this is your wild type response, this is the reduction in your untreated, and they were all much, very much in the, sorry, this is acuity and this is contrast, and they very much recovered back to wild type levels um, in this type of test. So both, both groups actually showed very nice response. Sorry, the significances have disappeared, but as you can see, they're very much in line with what a wild type response is, no matter what, what age you treated these animals. We were quite happy with that. This is the photopic ERG because I mentioned in patients is very much reduced. And you can see here, this is what a wild type response and our knockout model looks like. This is after the treatment from the three groups. Um, we did quantification of both your A wave and your B wave. Um, and you want those to improve um, with time and also over, uh, sorry, the different flash intensities and over time. This, these are the A wave and this is the B wave. However, we were only seeing um, an improvement either on the high dose or, or the NKT, for example. Um, so we, we, we didn't see any significant improvement on the AV8 uh, low dose on the photopic level. These are shorter waves um, amplitudes, so the improvements um, are a little bit harder to, to get significance. So we also do a flicker test, so which you, you can change the frequency of the flashes of light. And as you can see, it's, that response is much reduced in our untreated compared to the wild type. But we got a very nice recovery in all three of our groups of this particular test. When you quantify your N, which is your low, your down wave, and your P1, which is your up wave, we can see a nice, um, it becoming more significant, especially on the high dose AV8, but also sometimes of the NKT vector. Um, but we're not, we didn't really see much significance, even though there's a trend on the low dose um, AV8. We also did the same optometry behavioral testing um, for these animals, and we can see both the acuity and the contrast sensitivity. Um, we got a, a nice significance um, compared to the untreated coming up almost at the wild type level. Now, contrast sensitivity is a little bit variable, the response, so we didn't actually achieve significance, but you can see that there's definitely a trend of reducing. Um, that average for this particular test in the treated groups. So this is just show the expression um, of, of our 8.2 subunit. This is the untreated where you don't have 8.2 being expressed, but you do have 2.1. Um, and this is where we get the expression of the 8.2 coming up in all three of our treated groups in the right place. And it co-localizes co very nicely with the 2.1 subunit in where they should be. So in all three of our doses, the expression on, on the histology um, looks pretty similar. This is also when we looked at um, uh, qPCR, so gene expression. I didn't show the low dose um, responses because we weren't really getting much significance with those. We had to go up. And this is, I showed the AV8 and NKT at the three to the nine and the AV8 at the five to the nine. But when we looked at qPCR, we are getting an increased response. Um, we're not quite sure yet why the NKT here is, is not is just a little bit higher than the lower dose and much lower than the AV8. So we're still investigating that further, um, as I was expecting this to be higher than AV8. But, um, but at least we're showing a higher expression compared to the low dose NKT. We also ran single cell of the high dose um, treated group to see uh, overall gene expression in all the different uh, retinal cells. This is just the, the, the um, mapping of the different retinal cells within the single cells. 
And when we look at the treated uh, group compared to obviously wild type and KV8.2 untreated, we can see that expression of the KCNV2 gene. Um, this is a human gene, I, I forgot to mention. So we can actually isolate it from wild type KCNV2. Uh, you can see that it actually co-localizes very nicely to uh, the majority of your cells, which are your rods and your cones, which are your photoreceptors. When we look at specifically percentage of cells that are expressing KCNV2, that are positive for KCNV2, we're getting about 30% of rods and cones. And you get a little bit in some of the other cells, um, not surprising, microglia and mulaglia cells, they, they are kind of um, absorb a lot of what's going on in the retina. So you get a little bit higher, they're probably just taking up the virus, um, but it doesn't seem to be um, detrimental to these cells. So when we looked at the single cell, just looking at overall gene expression in both the rods and the cones that are expressed, the KCNV2 gene, we compared it to um, the wild type versus the untreated. So, sorry, this is the KV2 untreated versus wild type. Can, you can see this upregulation of different um, 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 biological pathways that are happening. So as part of the disease process, this is what's happening in the rods, this is what's happening in the cones. And when we compare the cells that are KV, a case in B2 positive in our treated retinas uh, versus wild type, you can see that you get a decrease of a lot of these pathways uh, happening. So they're all coming down in the expression, um, not obviously completely solved, but, um, but they are looking much better compared to the untreated. We also looked at a few other retinal cells, so mulaglia, rod bipolars, and cone on bipolars. And we saw that that same effect was also happening. This is on the untreated versus wild type. You can see upregulation of these different pathways and the and the, our, our overall not treated cells because these cells don't, we're looking at not the ones that are expressed, case in B2, because they don't, but um, overall these cells are particularly looking much better and starting to function a little bit better um, compared to wild type. This is, brings me to our summary um, when what well, we're looking at the AV-based gene therapy for KCNV2 retinopathy. And we were showing that the gene therapy is able to ameliorate the B wave, improve the A wave and the C wave. Um, that these treatment improvements can be seen um, even after late treatment and also at the long-term uh, stage. We showed restoration as the OP1 timing. So improved inner retinal function in response to the A wave is happening. The visual behavior recovery um, is recovered basically to wild type levels, both in the scotopic and the photopic testing. We're able to restore KCNV2, um, well, KV8.2 expression to the photoreceptors outer segment, and it's co-labeling with its co-partner KV2.1. And overall retinal gene expression um, is, is shown improvement beyond just the photoreceptor cells that are the target of the therapy. So I just wanted now to thank the retinal genomics and therapy team of mine that based at LEI at the Lions Eye Institute um, as part of the University of Western Australia. So this work was started by Professor David Hunt, which has been a very long time collaborator and was part of the team that discovered the KCNV2 gene. And he's now still um, helping us with the project and being, um, being part of this journey. And a lot of the work that I showed was done by Dr. Rabab Rashwan that did all the mouse work, the injections, the ERGs, um, a lot of work in the last three and a half years. And also Dr. Paula Fulakata has been helping us with the, the genomics and single cell analysis part of the project. And that's it for me. And I guess I'll be taking questions at the panel later. Thank you. Third speaker, uh, Dr. Grant Logan, uh, he's going to present his work on recovery of anti-AAV monoclonal antibodies from Zolgensma treated patients, uh, powerful tools for basic discovery and captured bioengineering. Uh, so Dr. Grant Logan is a senior scientist at the Children's Medical Research Institute um, here in Sydney, Australia, with over 25 years experience in researching viral vector systems for therapeutic gene delivery. Uh, his publications cover a range of areas, but Grant has a strong interest in the immunobiology of gene therapy using AAV um, virus vectors, both to leverage immunity as a powerful pressure point to induce therapeutic responses and to understand host vector interactions and how this prevents long-term transgene expression. Uh, Dr. Logan has also worked in the fields of human and environmental Virology. So again, apologies for the technical issues and now I'll hand over um, to Grant.
I want to thank the organisers of the symposium for the opportunity to present our work where we have recovered anti-AV monoclonal antibodies from infants uh, diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy and treated with the AAV gene therapy Zolgensma. So AAV9 gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy um, was reported as a clinical success back in 2017 by Jerry Mandel and his team, where they showed that a single infusion of an AV vector system could rescue infants from a, a devastating prognosis of uh, death by their second birthday. These infants uh, have gone on to uh, hit normal developmental milestones. And uh, this trial has really become the poster um, model for what gene therapy can achieve um, for, for the field for diseases for which there are not a lot of other options in terms of treatment. Um, upon seeing this report, our team was heavily involved in bringing this AV gene therapy to Australia in a clinical trial um, run by Avexis. Uh, this, the trial was called SPRINT and it was designed to detect um, spinal muscular atrophy before the development of symptoms and treat these infants with a single infusion of the AV9 delivery system. Uh, in that first trial, which commenced in 2018, uh, we screened a large number of infants in the state of New South Wales within Australia. Um, SMA has an incidence of about one in 10,000 births. Uh, there were six patients pre-screened in that initial trial, five of which went on to be treated. And in the intervening years, uh, we've gone on to treat more than 40 infants through a managed actors program. Um, and more recently, the federal government of Australia has listed this therapy on the PBS, which means that all Australians diagnosed with this particular illness uh, can go on to be treated. So this required a tremendous uh, effort. Um, you think of AV as a gene therapy as a one and done treatment, which sort of detracts from the idea of what's actually involved in, in running a trial like this. Um, the therapy was obviously developed through basic research, uh, preclinical development, and uh, it, we required regulatory approval in Australia to bring the treatment here. Uh, it required that infants be diagnosed before the development of symptoms. So there was thus a need to develop a pre-screening um, of these infants through a newborn screening program. And then the infants were um, assessed for eligibility to receive the therapy. And then once treated, they went on to, to have enormous benefit from this particular therapy. Uh, but the story I want to tell you today is more about um, what can be reaped from this hard work of bringing these sorts of trials to a clinic. And we're learning um, an improved understanding of disease pathogenesis um, and pathophysiology when it comes to spinal muscular atrophy. And as you'll see from this particular presentation, we've gone on to um, develop a, a unique set of reagents that are going to prove immensely powerful in uh, basic research to further develop better AAV delivery systems. So what I'm interested in predominantly is understanding this idea that um, the, this observation that um, infants or, or indeed any patient who may be eligible for AV gene therapy, particularly systemic AV gene therapy, um, has to undergo an antibody pre-screen. And the reason for this is because the AAV delivery system is endemic in human communities and our exposure to this delivery system can stimulate a cross-reactive immunity that then precludes a patient from uh, accessing the therapy because upon vector infusion, the vector would be neutralized and there'd be no benefit to the patient. Uh, so, the preclinical models have, have um, predicted this quite accurately. And we know then that treatment of, of individuals with a certain level of antibodies um, is likely to be unsuccessful. The antibody response is made to the capsid protein that, uh, that um, encapsidates the um, genetic cargo of the delivery system. 
Um, it maintains virion stability. Um, it protects the genetic cargo and enables it to be trafficked through the body, where upon encountering the appropriate cellular receptor, it's, um, it uptake, it's, the capsid mediates the uptake of the genetic cargo um, and then intracellular transport to the cell nucleus um, where transduction once successful leads to the expression of the therapeutic um, protein. The virion itself um, is an icosahedral structure and it can be topologically divided into a number of regions, the twofold, the threefold and the fivefold axis, axis. and uh, also uh, this space between the two and five-fold channel, um, five-fold axis, which we call the two five-fold wall. We understand the uh, amino acid sequence of the viral proteins that um, come together to make up the virion, uh, and we understand the regions um, on this uh, amino acid sequence um, that can be found at each of these topological locations. And so it was really interesting to see this paper come out in PNAS in 2017 from Aravind Azakin's group, where they effectively were showing a way forward in re-engineering re the AAV vector system to avoid pre-existing immunity and enable the successful delivery of genetic cargo. Um, they mapped the dominant monoclonal antibodies uh, epitopes on the AV1, a capsid um, using cryo-electron microscopy. And then they um, focused on these monoclonals at the threefold axis to erase uh, the epitopes so that these monoclonals would be detargeted. And then um, this new vari variant of AV1 was shown to avoid the pre-existing immune response that was developed in response to the parent vector. Uh, and this new variant was able to um, travel intra, in, in vivo and deliver its genetic cargo to the muscles of, of the mouse. And so this was a really um, good demonstration of a proof in principle of what could be achieved potentially in humans. Um, and, and so it also demonstrated that these monoclonal antibodies are powerful tools for capsid bioengineering and understanding capsid function. So at the time, and, and even now, um, the current state of the field with respect to anti-AV monoclonal antibodies um, was that there was 22 well-characterized MABs uh, reactive to multiple capsid serotypes, but all were murine in origin. There had been no description of human monoclonal antibodies, at least ones that were uh, well-characterized, such as the mouse monoclonal antibodies. And it was known that all monoclonal antibodies um, that had been isolated had um, bound the topological regions of the AV capsid at the two, three, five, and two, five fold wall. And so for us to take this strategy forward into humans um, um, presupposed that the mouse antibodies would accurately uh, emulate human antibodies. Um, but as this was an unknown question, we set about to clone and characterize human anti-AV monoclonal antibodies. So we had access to patient samples um, where the infants had been treated with Solgensma, AVXS101 at the time. Uh, and I want to point out that these infants receive a huge infusion. They receive an infusion of a huge dose of AV9 vector. Uh, so this is 100 million million vector genomes per kilogram. Um, and this is delivered over a, a, approximately a one hour period um, in, in the clinic. These infants are heavily immunosuppressed. So it was um, quite surprising, at least to me, to see that the anti-AV9 antibody response in these infants um, was robust and high and much higher than individuals, um, normal um, donors who had been exposed to AAV circulating in the community, um, which you can see here. And there was a, a large number of um, patients of healthy donor samples in which we uh, were unable to detect AAV9 um, IgG. Uh, this black dot here indicates um, 
the sample taken from a mother of an infant who was um, precluded from receiving the AV9 gene therapy because her infant had um, an unacceptably high level of uh, anti-AV9 IgG. We were interested in understanding the cross-reactivity of these, this particular response in these infants. Uh, so against a battery of AV9 capsid serotypes that you can see um, denoted in the, in the coloured font, uh, we set about um, looking at how these particular sera samples cross-reacted to other AV capsids over time. Uh, and you can see that um, without fail, all these um, six patients that we have screened um, go on to develop an AV antibody response with AV9 being the highest denoted in black with um, varying degrees of reactivity depending on the capsid serotype uh, with the response to AV5, the most phylogenetic phylogenetically distant AV capsid um, with the lowest, um, with usually the lowest titers. So this demonstrated to us that uh, even if you wanted to pre-treat pre these particular patients, the level of AAV antibodies to any of these serotypes would preclude uh, their access to um, a retreatment using an AAV9 or an AAV vector system. So having established this high serological response, we were interested in understanding whether these infants had um, a frequency of switched memory B cells, which would encode um, the variable regions of the antibody um, um, the antibodies that we're detecting in sera um, and, and whether these could be a potential source of anti-AV monoclonal antibodies. So we established this pipeline where we cloned, um, the PBM, we cloned the PBMCs from these infants. We isolated the switch memory B cells and um, cloned them to 384 well plates. We pre-screened the plates looking for supernatants with AAV9 reactivity and we RTPC amplified the variable regions from each of these clones to recover uh, the variable domain of the IgG, subcloned either the, um, the heavy and the light chains that, in, um, that encode the antibody sequences, uh, reconstituted um, the heavy and light chain as a functional IgG, and then purified the monoclonal antibody for downstream characterization. When we screened, uh, these plates for AAV uh, reactivity, uh, we found in fact that these infants had a quite a high lip frequency of switch memory B cells circulating in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells um, in their circulatory system. So for instance, patient one here, um, days post antigen stimulus, we seeded 2,400 wells of which approximately 29% of these wells were IgG reactive and we um, then re recovered 39 uh, react reactive clones. Um, and this gave us an, uh, a frequency of about 5.5% of uh, switch memory B cells circulating in the periphery of uh, this particular patient as being reactive to AAV9. So this is the sort of level that you often see when a an individual has been vaccinated and then switch memory B cells assessed for reactivity to the vaccine antigen. Um, and so this gave us quite a high level of uh, frequency of cells from which we could clone these antibody, anti-AAV uh, reactive uh, antibodies. And this contrasted with the mother of the infant that I pointed out before, um, where we detected really quite a, a low frequency of switched memory um, B cell clones in, in, her, um, in her circulatory system. So we believe that the success of this particular approach is because these individuals received high vector dose um, and we knew the timing of the AV exposure um, and therefore we could harvest and recover their switch memory B cells in a, in a timely fashion. Um, so we have gone on to reconstitute 35 anti AV9 reactive monoclonal antibodies from each of these three infants. We've in silico analyzed their variable regions and we find that um, there's evidence for hyper, um, somatic hypermutation, uh, indicating that the clones have undergone affinity maturation. They're predominantly um, IgG um, subclass one, but with some showing IgG three subclass um, and two, we were unable to determine. 
there wasn't anything remarkable about the variable domains of these particular IgG. There was no um, difference really in the length of the CDR3 um, regions in either the heavy or, or the light chains. And we then selected a subset of these 35 monoclonal antibodies, 21 um, were further purified and characterized. Um, and we chose seven from each patient that we recovered in chronological order. Um, these set of graphs indicate uh, the purified monoclonal antibodies and their reactivity to AAV9 uh, in an ELISA and uh, their capacity to neutralize in vitro transduction in a, in a cell culture uh, luciferase readout system. Uh, you can see that there's varying degrees of reactivity of each of the monoclonal antibodies and that this is often um, then a reflected in the uh, capacity for the antibody to neutralize AAV9 transduction. Um, in some instances, we observed um, with some antibodies um, almost a, um, a, an enhancement of AAV9 transduction. This has been observed for um, other types of um, mouse monoclonals and, um, and polyclonal sera. We then surveyed these antibodies for their cross-reactivity to other capsid regions as indicated in, in this template here. Um, so you see the seven monoclonal antibodies from patient one and from patient two and patient three. Obviously, all are reactive to AV9, um, but some show cross-reactivity to the other capsids um, universally, except for AAV5 cross-reactivity. Um, this particular antibody showed cross-reactivity to um, capsids 8 and 10, and uh, this antibody showed cross-reactivity to uh, RH10. Uh, and this is our control showing that we have uh, equivalent amounts of capsid um, blotted to the immunoblot um, as detected by the uh, B1 mouse monoclonal antibody. We then looked at, um, we assessed these monoclonal antibodies um, using cryoelectron microscopy. This was all done by um, a remarkable team in Florida, Rob and Mario. Um, and we found um, that when we looked at this first set of seven from patient one, that we had quite a nice mix of um, two, five, two fold binders uh, we had a three-fold binder, a five-fold binder, and a two-five a binder that um, that that identified a site at the two-five-fold wall, and this was much to the delight of Robin Maria, who had worked with mouse monoclonal antibodies for many decades, and um, observed this same pattern of um, binding in their murine antibodies. Um, and they um, were very encouraged to see that the human monoclonal antibodies um, from this first patient were binding similar topological regions. When we then looked at the subsequent monoclonal antibodies, again, uh, we found um, two-fold binders, three-fold three binders, and another five-fold binder, um, but predominantly the antibodies from these next two patients bound uh, the two-fold axis of symmetry. These are the um, antibodies that I mentioned before that showed cross-reactivity. And you can see that those that were broadly cross-reactive to other capsid serotypes are binding the five-fold axis of symmetry, um, which is in line with um, the Florida team's hypothesis that this is where you're most likely to get cross-reactivity um, because this is the most um, conserved region of the capsid across capsid serotypes. We found that um, the affinity of each of these antibodies spread, spanned a broad range of, um, of um, from, from sub-nanomolar up to 200 um, nanomolar binding affinity. And there was only a modest correlation between binding affinity and the capacity of the antibody to neutralize vector entry. And this makes sense because um, antibody um, capacity to neutralize vector would depend not only on the affinity of the antibody, but also the region in which the antibody was binding. 
And so if we go back and compare what we observed in the mouse monoclonal antibodies against the human, you can see that the humans are binding predominantly at the twofold axis of symmetry, while those binding um, the mouse monoclonal antibodies binding the threefold axis of symmetry. And we're starting to see as we resolve these um, antibodies at high resolution that there are uh, distinct interactions underlying these higher order patterns. So the novelty of our research findings are that uh, we've undertaken a detailed investigation of the anti-AV capsid antibody response. These um, responses are observed in infants who have had no prior um, exposure to a wild type AV in, endemic in the community. Um, we've observed a high frequency of any AV reactive switch memory B cells in these infants. And this can, um, this observation could be used then um, as, as a, a Templar um, for others to start cloning similar switch memory B cells from patients exposed to other AV capsid serotypes in other trials. This is the largest series of human anti-AV capsid antibodies that have ever been structurally and functionally characterized. And we um, observed binding affinities in the sub-nanomolar range. And um, these um, antibodies um, offer an opportunity for us to go ahead and look at the structural um, differences in binding of mouse and human MABs to the capsid serotype. So we see these antibodies as really powerful tools for basic discovery, both from the perspective of um, detection of AAV capsids um, using ELISA, but uh, we're starting to explore the possibility for understanding AV capsid function better um, using these antibodies, looking at functional domains, vector capsid host interactions, um, understanding the virus receptor binding sites and what epitopes um, look like that um, have the capacity to neutralize vector transduction. So we have moved on to start mapping these antibodies at high resolution. The, resolu the low uh, resolution images I've just shown you were in uh, the range of about 10 um, angstroms. Uh, we're starting to look at these antibodies now and resolving um, structures at two to five angstroms. And we're taking a, a two pronged approach to using these antibodies to start engineering AV9 um, variants that escape um, monoclonal antibody neutralization. So we've focused on those uh, antibodies that bind at the twofold axis of symmetry um, and the team in Florida are currently um, building and characterizing a, an AV9 variant that can target uh, 15 of the 21 monoclonal antibodies that I've shown you today. Um, in Sydney, we're looking at using these monoclonal antibodies as a selection pressure in in vitro model where we can start to um, genetically detect um, and identify capsid variants that, are take, that escape monoclonal antibody um, neutralization. And um, the team in Florida are starting to dissect the mechanisms by which these monoclonal antibodies neutralize vector transduction. So with that, I would just like to thank um, all these people, but in particular, Michelle Farah and her team at Sydney Children's Hospital Network who cared for these SMA patients, uh, the team in Florida who um, produced all of the dot blot and the Crow electron microscopy data, Joe Reed, uh, who gave us a um, really lovely overview on how we should go forth and clone the switch memory B cell um, variable regions from our particular clones and the team um, led by Daniel Christ at the Garvin um, Medical Research Institute um, who purified all of the monoclonal antibodies that we went on to characterise. And thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Grant. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the um, session today, uh, Associate Professor Andrew Deans. Um, Andrew's going to um, present his work on improved prime editing range and delivery for precise gene editing in bone marrow. Uh, just as a, a short introduction, Andrew has worked for 25 years now on how cells respond to and repair DNA damage. First as a PhD student with Grant MacArthur at the Peter Callum uh, Cancer Centre in Melbourne, and then as a postdoc with Steve West at the Francis Crick Institute in London. 
Uh, since 2011, Andrew has led the Genome Stability Unit at St Vincent's Institute back in Melbourne, where he continues to work investigating the molecular mechanisms of DNA repair. More recently, his focus has shifted to understanding how DNA repair pathways regulate the outcomes of gene editing and how gene editing can be applied in bone marrow failure system, uh, syndromes, apologies, where DNA repair defects are a common cause. So over to you, Andrew. Hi there, and thanks for the introduction. And thank you also to the societies for inviting me to present my work here today where I'll be uh, introducing our work on prime editing, which is a relatively new method that uses Cas9 enzyme that we're all relatively familiar with, fused to reverse transcriptases um, to rewrite the genetic code in both human or other cells. So the big advantage of this technology is the inclusion of the edit template as an extension to the guide RNA, uh, which we are all familiar with. Uh, and it therefore removes the requirement for a DNA template. Double strand breaks are also not necessary and a mutant Cas9 enzyme cleaves just a single strand to create a flap structure, which anneals uh, to this three prime extension to the so-called prime editing guide RNA or PEG RNA. This is where the reverse transcriptase becomes involved. And this part of the prime editor then copies the template region and introduces the uh, change directly into the genome uh, as shown here. There are then two possible outcomes via branch migration of the flap to either remove this edit or to incorporate it stably into the genome. And some recent evidence that suggests that suppression of cellular mismatch repair can promote this forward editing reaction to occur. So although prime editing is highly efficient, it still has some limitations before it can be adapted for use clinically. And with, with all editing methods uh, that use this uh, SPCAS9, there's a requirement for a unique spacer sequence that can target the enzyme uh, to the correct location in the genome where you'd like to edit. And this has to be just adjacent to a PAM sequence or a protospace or adjacent motif, which is an NGG. There's also the ongoing problem of delivering these large enzymes into primary cells and making sure that we can detect the editing of uh, the cells that we're editing in vivo, uh, both in the cells we're interested in and other nearby cells. So I'd like to start by introducing a method that addresses this final problem and we'll go back to some of the others a bit later on in my talk. So we needed an assay that could detect gene editing outcomes without having to do DNA sequencing, uh, which is both time consuming and expensive. So we chose the EGFP to BFP conversion assay, which was invented by Astrid Glasser during her um, PhD studies here in, Mur in Melbourne at the Murdoch Research Institute with Jim Bertelas. So Astrid discovered that you could edit two base pairs in the EGFP um, DNA sequence that uh, converted to amino acids. So the uh, fluorescence of the protein shifts from green to blue uh, to produce BFP. So this is revealed beautifully in this cell culture experiment uh, of green and blue cells. And you can see that the S assay uh, can resolve both the percentage edited cells uh, as well as in a, a localization um, and a time resolved manner. So here in this FACTS experiment with 100% starting population of GFP positive cells, you can treat the cells with Cas9 and a guide RNA that edits the GFP sequence, but when a template, and, and this knocks out the gene. Um, however, when you provide a template encoding the blue fluorescent um, amino acids, uh, a good fraction of the cells, about a quarter in this experiment become blue, but still you can see that the majority of the cells knock out the GFP sequence. So using this assay, um, when Astrid joined my lab, uh, she tested several different of these um, prime editing guide RNAs using prime editors now instead of just the Cas9 nuclease. And what you can see is that actually um, a, a much, what she observed was a much larger number of the cells became edited to blue. But more importantly, um, we don't see this large fraction of cells um, knocking out the GFP gene. And this suggested to us that prime editing is much better at um, templated repair than, uh, than regular uh, Cas9 nuclease enzyme. 
So with this um, high throughput assay for identifying gene editing outcomes, um, we look to address some of these other issues that are associated with prime editing. Sorry, associated uh, with prime editing. So as you might know, and I, I already briefly mentioned, um, the wild type uh, Cas9 enzyme requires a 19 to 21 base pair unique protospacer sequence next to a, a three base pair NGG protospacer adjacent motif or PAM. So for example, if we wanted to uh, edit this premature stop codon um, out of the genome, uh, as shown here, there um, is only one um, PAM sequence which is close by, but this is associated with a protospacer that's very A-rich and is likely, unlikely to be unique in the genome. There's another PAM sequence up here in the opposite orientation, but we already know for prime editing, the further we go away with the, with the spacer region, the lower the efficiency goes. So Lou, Lou, a PhD student, and Astrid, uh, together with Astrid in the lab, engineered a series of novel um, prime editors that take advantage of some of these Cas9 variants that have been developed by various labs. And these Cas9 um, enzymes have been in vitro evolved to have a wider range of um, uh, specificity for different PAM sequences. For example, the SPG um, Cas9 enzyme has a requirement just for a single G in an NG and PAM. The iSpy Mac uh, has been adapted, modified to recognize uh, di, um, ad, ad, di A sequences. And um, the SPRY enzyme was developed by the Kleinsteiner lab to have pretty much close to no PAM requirement whatsoever. So together, um, these uh, combinations could be useful for editing um, almost uh, any genome sequence, or that was our hope. <clears throat> we tested these uh, using the uh, pair RNA that we that Astrid had already optimized in the lab with the wild type or the variant um, enzymes, and you can see that SPG has similar activity to wild type prime editor protein PE2, SPRY slightly reduced, and these enzymes which have an a AA PAM specificity were not able to act at all. However, when we switched um, to protospaces with an NG and PAM, we found that now only SPG and SPRY were able to act. Or if we switch to PAMs where there is no G present at the plus two position, um, you can see that only the SPRY was able to edit, uh, generate blue cells. And uh, the fraction of blue cells is quite low, probably because this spacer sequence is actually not particularly useful one. But um, after testing a whole lot of different PEG RNAs with different PAM specificities in different combinations of enzymes, and you can see that the, the high throughput nature of this assay is fantastic for this purpose. What we discovered was that if an NGG PAM exists, then the wild type PE2 enzyme is the best one to use. However, <clears throat> for um, uh, PAMs which contain just a single G at the plus two position, or even for um, GAA PAM sequences, the SPG enzyme uh, does seem to have the highest level of editing. And the use of the ice by Mac and SPRY uh, prime editors might be better suited uh, in very specific uh, situations where there are no G residues nearby. So in the first part of my talk, um, I've shown you that we can increase both the uh, efficiency of gene editing and the number of potential mutation sequences that can be edited by um, adapting the GFP BFP reporter assay um, for use in prime editing and using uh, different derivatives of uh, Cas9, which have altered PAM specificity. But another big issue, of course, um, working with prime editors is delivering these editing vectors um, into cells. So, um, these are a few of the methods that have been used to deliver traditional Cas9 enzymes into eukaryotic cells. DNA uh, by transfection, of course, is the most widely used and easiest to use in terms of a laboratory setting, but it's not really clinically um, very useful. And uh, if we're talking about using it in primary cells, it causes uh, integration and in, in innate immune stimulation, which is not useful. So many of people have switched to using AAVs or other um, associated viruses, but these have uh, capacity issues, which means they we have to try and make the prime editors smaller and they've therefore become less efficient, or we have to use multiple viruses to deliver the cassettes. Messenger RNA and recombinant protein or RNPs have been very successful for delivering 
Cas9 nuclease into cells. Um, and the last one that I talk about is bacular virus, which is an insect expression virus that my lab has a lot of experience working with um, uh, because we're a primarily a research lab of biochemists, uh, but it's not quite currently widely used for gene editing. But first of all, I wanted to talk about messenger RNA because I think that's the one so far we've had the most success with. Uh, and we make messenger RNA similar to how they're made in the COVID vaccines, which um, hopefully everybody is um, fairly familiar with um, these days. We transcribe uh, plasmid DNA into messenger RNA using T7 polymerase. Uh, for efficient translation in cells, we then have to add a five prime cap and a three prime polydenylation sequence in vitro. Uh, and then we mix this mature messenger RNA with a synthetically synthesized PEG RNA uh, for nuclear affection into cells. So remarkably, um, using these uh, purified components, we could see um, 100% transfection, but more nearly 100% of the cells were edited, or over 90% of the cells are edited uh, to BFP, as shown in this fa um, fax plot. So really, messenger RNA delivery, or a totally RNA-based system, is absolutely fantastic for um, gene editing using this primate editing delivery method. Um, and, and that can just be seen this comparison here now. We've really got to the point where we're almost getting um, complete allylic conversion um, using a, a gene editing technology. So the bacular virus delivery system is another one of the methods that I'd like to briefly introduce. Uh, and these viruses are relatively easy to work with. Uh, the viral genome can be manipulated as a BACMID in bacteria, E. coli, and can carry up to 80 kb um, of additional material when this is um, converted into DNA in cells. So Lou integrated this uh, 6KB prime editor, CMV prime editor cassette into the bacular virus genome. Um, and normally, because these are insect viruses, they don't actually transduce human cells particularly well. Um, however, if we pseudotype them with the standard VSVG pseudotyping, which is used in other viruses, we can get them to go much better into human cells. Um, Lou incorporated this on the same cassette. So a second transfer vector is then used to integrate the PEG RNA sequence for targeting any particular genomic region and an orange fluorescent reporter uh, protein, which we like to use orange because it doesn't come up in the green or blue channels that we're using for the GFP, BFP reporter assay. So the bacular virus itself uh, can be grown up in insect cells. Um, so it can be, uh, and these are just simple uh, shaker cultures grown at 27 degrees that don't even need carbon dioxide. Uh, and then when we put these uh, onto cells, you can see by facts that human fibroblasts or, or, or mouse fibroblasts or um, mouse bone marrow cells uh, can be transduced to express the MKO2 protein uh, as determined by flow cytometry. For hex cells, remarkably, the, the BFP positive cell at cell numbers at day 10 are again approaching that 90% level. And this is highly correlated with the level of MKO2 expression that we see um, at at day one um, after transduction. So the more the more cells we can get transduced, uh, effectively that correlates with the number of cells uh, which become edited. <clears throat> so to transfer this assay into animals, we've generated um, the ROSA26 uh, EGFP line. And these mice have a single copy of the GFP gene in every cell of their body, uh, located at the ROSA26 locus. And you can see that the cells are highly fluorescent and highly and uniformly fluorescent. Um, and if we stick the whole mouse onto a light box, uh, you can see that they grow glow uh, a, a nice green color. So they've got uh, green tissues, green stem cells, and we're now in the process of manipulating these cells both in vitro and in vivo with prime editing. And I'll show you a bit more later on in the talk. Um, but uh, using the bacular virus system, uh, we get about 7% uh, of the cells uh, that can be edited in, in actually this is a relatively um, unoptimized uh, set of experiments. Um, ultimately, we want to uh, use these bacular viruses in vivo, and once we've optimized them in vitro, we will be trying some in vivo experiments. So the bacular virus system is very easy to work with. Um, the prime editing and pseudotyping components are already stably integrated into the bacular virus genome, and so the only thing that has to be incorporated in, in via the shuttle is the PEG RNA. Then it's a simple transfection into insect cells, collection of the virus supernatants and put those onto human cells. 
you can clone any PEG RNA in via a simple transformation and blue-white selection. And we have shown the general applicability using a panel of um, PEG RNAs. So in summary, um, both the messenger RNA and baculovirus virus delivery methods are making really big improvements to the delivery of, of prime editing into both uh, immortalized cell lines, but also primary cell types. We've also generated a recombinant prime editor protein or RNP, and this works in hex cells and in K562 cells. Um, but again, we haven't really optimized it and, uh, and the GFP BFP reported system will be great for helping us to get there better. So all three of these methods really have a great benefit of being completely transient in nature. The gene editing happens, but then the transgenes and the expressions disappear, leaving just the targeted edit behind in the cells. Uh, so that means there's no integration into the genome uh, and there's no ongoing uh, editing happening over time. But really everything I've shown you so far is in cell lines. Uh, in reality, what we want to use prime editing for is editing of hematopoietic stem cells uh, in uh, to correct basic, or other tissues um, to correct genetic disorders. So um, hematopoietic stem cells, or they're sometimes known as HSCs, are the precursors of all the different blood lineages and cell types of the blood. Um, but uh, the hematopoietic stem cells are actually often quite strongly affected in various genetic disorders, including one that we've had interest in for a long time in my lab called Fanconi anemia. HSCs are unique in that they can be isolated and manipulated ex vivo or outside the body, and then they can be reinfused into the body to generate um, new blood, all of these blood cell types. But more importantly, you can edit just a very small fraction of cells outside the body. And this can have a very, uh, very high therapeutic benefit, particularly in these bone marrow failure syndromes where corrected hemopoietic stem cells have a significant growth advantage over the mutant HSCs that are, that are present already in the um, person. So we want to use prime editing in HSCs as kind of the launch pad for using these genetic technologies because in many ways, in particular because of these two points, um, they're the low-hanging fruit in terms of uh, application of prime editing or, or other gene editing applications. So um, in order to get towards uh, uh, editing in HSCs, um, Lou generated an immortalized myeloid cell line from the Rosa 26 mice. Um, and she used this uh, cell line because it's very difficult to get the number of HSCs necessary because they're a very rare cell type. But in the next couple of slides, I'll show you the power of this GFP BFP reporter assay in optimizing both the editing rates and the delivery method uh, on a primary cell type. So you can see here, um, just a very quick summary, DNA and bacular virus doesn't work in these cells, but messenger RNA and ribonuclear protein does. We can optimize the uh, transduction efficiency and survival using different nuclear affection methods. And then uh, iteratively improve the editing and achievable editing with different amounts of, for example, messenger RNA, uh, amounts of PEG RNA, which are included with the messenger RNA, or the amounts of protein and their ratio to the PEG RNA. Uh, or in this particular experiment using PE3, which is a slightly different um, version of the prime editing system that uses a second guide RNA, the ratio of the PEG RNA to the guide RNA, um, we can screen very rapidly. So this is just some of the final data that I've shown you here. Uh, but I remember when Lou started doing these experiments, she was getting less than 1% of blue cells. And we finished up after, after a detailed uh, optimization, round of optimizations of nearly 60% of the cells from a single messenger RNA nuclear affection um, have been edited uh, from GFP to BFP. So we then took these optimized conditions that were generated from the immortalized cells into real HSCs. And these are derived from uh, sorting of cells from whole blood from these mice. And you can show, see here that the HSC population called LSK plus represent only about 0.2% of the total cell population in the blood but after a short expansion in vitro um, of these flow cytometry purified cells, we have a, a really pure population. And these results show that we can edit um, using RNPs or using um, messenger RNA more than a third of these um, stem cells in a single nuclear affection experiment. So 
we're really excited about these results and the potential that they have um, for, for therapeutic application. And if we use a relatively more simple isolation method, which is just a SCAR1 enrichment, we get a higher number of cells isolated and an overall higher level of prime editing as shown by um, BFP positivity. This could be because more mature cells are present and they're the ones more likely to be edited, but it also is equally likely that having more cells in the cuvette when doing that nuclear affection experiment means better transfection rates and survival. And obviously looking at um, LMPs, lipid nanoparticles as a delivery method instead of um, nuclear affection is, is something we're going towards next as well. So we're taking cells edited by both of these methods for transplant into recipient mice, and we really hope to show that the blue edited cells are capable of regenerating uh, normal blood and, and hope to have uh, these results in, in the next few months. Okay, so we're also um, obviously looking for collaborators who are interested in in vivo editing of different mouse tissues. Um, you can contact me on these email address or, or via Twitter here. Uh, we're interested in, in partners who have particular interests in tissues or um, targets that they like might like to edit with prime editing. Um, but really importantly, I'd like to thank all the team in the Genome Stability Unit um, here at, at St. Vincent's Institute in Melbourne. Uh, the gene editing projects uh, are primarily being led by Astrid Glasser, who, uh, as I mentioned, invented the GFP to BFP assay that's widely used around the world. The, a lot of the bacular virus uh, development and, and hemopoietic stem cell work was done by Lou, uh, who's just writing up her PhD and looking for a postdoc position. Uh, and Lorna McLeeman, uh, who's a paediatrician and bone marrow transplanter, who recently joined the editing uh, program to help us move this work into human patient samples and eventual clinical usage. Abdul's working on some of the cool in vivo delivery methods. Um, and I'd also like to really thank the funders of this work um, for their ongoing support. And also thank you to you for listening today. Uh, I'm really happy to take questions in the discussion uh, forum at the end. Thanks again for listening. Um, okay. All right, Grant. So maybe I'll ask uh, you a question just to get things um, started. <laughs> um, I guess my question would be how stable are these um, antibody responses in, in, these, in these children? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, we, we've started looking at that um, and we, we've been looking at two patients in particular so far and um, the antibody levels that I showed for those patients in the data on the slides was actually quite high and stable. And we've continued to see that beyond three years. And uh, we're continuing to collect uh, additional samples from this cohort. And, and we uh, intend looking at these patients over the longer term. I had expected to see the IgG levels start to drop by this stage, but um, they seem to be as high as ever. And it will be it will be interesting to follow these infants over the longer term to see if we can um, and see any change in in the serological status of these patients. Mm. And based on sort of you know what's been known, what's known already, you know, it sounds that you're a little surprised that they're still so high. Um, you know, if you were to guess how long yes. would these, you know, keep. In, in a classical response, you start to sort, you start to see the um, the antibody levels uh, begin to wane over time, and that hasn't been the case here. Uh, and these children are being infused with with a really high number of, of vector particles, uh, and it's really difficult to decide or to determine how this compares with what you might see in a natural infection. Um, so it's. It's it's quite a it's quite a novel sort of approach to to looking at antibodies um, to AV9 um, in, in this context, and um, it'll be I mean th this is really a work in progress. So it'll be interesting to see how this transpires over the longer term. Yeah, it really will be quite fascinating. Um, Grant, we've got a question in the chat for you. Um, uh, so um, thanks, L'Oreal. Um, uh, she said, great presentation. Any thoughts on why the twofold is targeted by human anti antibodies? Yeah, uh, great question. And in short, I really don't know the answer to this. I found it, uh, we've really probably sampled quite a small 
um, number of antibodies that are circulating in the in the circulatory systems of these infants. Um, and the first patient really um, produced quite a range of different um, binding sites across the different antibodies that we surveyed. The next two patients was predominantly at the twofold axis of symmetry. And it's um, and we, we don't understand why that is. We would like to keep going and analyze the other antibodies that we've isolated from this group to see if, um, if this is a pattern that is maintained. Um, but you know, at this stage, I don't have any good answer as to why it would be the twofold that's predominantly targeted in, in the humans um, in, in this particular instance. It's a question that we, we still intend to get to the heart of. Thanks, Grant. Grant, can um, I ask a question as well? Is there any other? <laughs> Andrew okay. wants to ask. Yeah. Yes, please. Please do, Andrew. Um, <laughs> we kind of heard a lot at the beginning about all the, the different AAV variants. Do you think that antibodies would have the same response <laughs> as all those variants? <laughs> and, and could be variants that were less immunogenic, for example? Um, sorry, there was just a speaker that went off just at the start of your question. You, you were saying you oh, heard yeah. so, a lot about um, the different AV variants. Yeah, so my question was whether the antibodies would be expected to recognise all of the AAV variants and whether you could design AAV variants that were less immunogenic but, yeah, but still have the activity. Yeah. Um, the, the, the AAV um, if you want for better word, serotypes or variants that we that we know about have a, I guess, a range of different homologies. And we would expect that those that are highly similar to AV9 to have the strongest cross-reactivity, whereas those that start to look less and less like AV9 would you you would have decreasing cross-reactivity, um, the more distantly um, related that they become. We're we're hoping. I mean, we're working from the premise that a small number of changes to the capsid um, structure at the surface will hopefully detarget sufficient antibodies that we can start to then fly mm. these vectors in under the antibody radar. And, you know, that sort of sounds like an impossible task, but if you think of the AV capsid as a series of replicating structures, uh, there's you know, 60 different units, that if you make a single change in one unit, it's going to reflect broadly across the entire capsid. So mm -hmm. we, we hope that um, by producing slight variations in the surface that we can then produce um, capsid serotypes, not necessarily that would be less immunogenic, but that could potentially uh, escape immunity that may already be there um, against different capsid variants or serotypes. Cool, thanks. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Grant. Hi, Olivia. Um, I might have a question for you if you don't mind in um, the chat. I thank you um, for your presentation. I know it's an early start for you in Western Australia. Um, I okay. guess my question would be, um, you know, given such, you know, nice <laughs> um, you know, preclinical data. What are your next steps with this approach, and how your what are your plans to translate this? I guess would be my question to you. Yeah, I think we were quite um, happy with the the results. I think with the with the eye, you you know, we we get we get quite hopeful that at least in the mouse model, we've been able to do it several of these rescues and and show you no know, decent efficacy. This one was a little bit tricky because we had a slightly unique phenotype, which is usually the opposite of what we're trying to do. You're trying to recover something from little to more. In this, we were trying to reduce that supernormal response. So we weren't sure how that was going to come out after the treatment. So we were quite happy to show that that's coming down. Um, and that becomes, it's becoming for us the most you know, important outcome as well, even if some of the other outcomes won't as significant as we hoped, but this one is definitely coming up in several of the of the points. So our, for, our step now to moving forward is obviously looking at safety and toxicity, moving into a different, um, well, a, a large animal species, probably uh, primates, to see whether the therapy is actually safe and go through the whole, you know, IND process. Um, this therapy, due to the rarity, it might start um, 
approval and all that process in the US and not so much in Australia yet. But we are working with uh, researchers here and trying to map out the patients that are in Australia for this condition so that if we do get to a trial, we hopefully can have a multi-centre trial. That would be the plan in the near long-term future-ish. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, so the first step now is to get this safety and toxicity data out of the way and make sure that it's okay. And then we can start making plans for a clinical trial, hopefully. Fantastic. Thanks, Livia. So, um, Grant, I think I have another um, question in the chat um, from you, um, from L'Oreal again. Um, her question is, do you think purification processes might affect where antibodies target? Um, uh, in brackets, think about research grade A, Bs in mice versus P in humans. Thanks, Laurie, you're coming up with some really great questions. Um, I've honestly not thought about that process. I've thought about uh, how perhaps different um, production processes in terms of producing the capsids may produce different changes depending on um, post-translational modifications and, and other aspects to that. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea. I don't, I don't, again, I don't have a good answer for you, um, but it, it's, I guess it's possible depending on any chemical modifications that may occur um, during the process of purification, you know, what sort of um, columns and the likes. I would like to think that all purification processes are rather innocuous when it comes to the capsid itself, but I guess we don't know enough about this aspect of things. What we're doing seems to work for us quite well. I suppose as others start to do similar sorts of processes with the same capsids, we could start to understand if there were changes depending on the purification process that was used during the manufacturing of the, of the viral delivery system. I think Sam, maybe you're Well, Well, we're waiting, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, yeah. I have a GFP model, actually, that I might be interested okay. in talking to you. It expresses in a particular type of cone of cells in the, in the, in the eye. So okay. if you're interested in testing it in that one, it's, um, so we can have a chat off, yeah, offline. Cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. okay. Does it have just a single, we need to have a single GFP copy, copy if possible, but if it has Ooh, not, yeah, yeah, I have to, because it was made through a back system. Um, so it might have, it's upstream of a particular promoter, Okay, so I should... might I might uh, have a look at the papers. Um, I yeah, I'm not quite sure if it's only okay. one copy, but it, it yeah, it should be because it was was inserted through this promoter system. Um, but I think their original premise was to make you know insertion in all sorts of different places and then screened for it. So, but it's only expressed in these particular cells. So I, I'm assuming it's it's only one copy. Okay. Andrew, there's a question for you in the chat from Tracy Bryan, and she's interested to know whether there are, if you know yet, whether there's any mouse-human differences in delivery using any of Hi, the methods that you Can everyone hear me? Discussed. Sorry, I'm having issues. We can now, Sam. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I'm back, Brent, sorry. Brent, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry about that. Question in the chat, so... Um. <laughs> As you do, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so in terms of um, mouse to human differences, so um, the bacular virus ha work has, there, ha there are other examples where people have used bacular virus delivery into mouse models, um, rabbit models, and certainly a lot of human cell lines can be transduced by bacular virus. For in vivo use, Bacular virus may not be the best option because it's rapidly in complement inactivated. But they're obviously for ex vivo use is fantastic. And there are a few potential methods that can be used to overcome that complement resistance. And there are some publications um, uh, suggesting that I think it's CD155, which is a complement receptor, can be used to. Um, protect the bacular virus in in vivo settings, um, but we're mostly right. interested in vitro at the moment because obviously with hematopoietic cool. stem cells you can mimic ex vivo, and in the eye can I think I... it's a fantastic option because of that immune privilege as well. You also mm -hmm. get um, yeah. 
And can I ask an extension from that? I was interested to see that you said that these cells, I mean, you're looking at it, you've got a nice control with orange fluorescence. Um, and you said that that level was maintained, it was found at 10 days post gene modification. But is that an integration an event or is there still episomal expression? Uh, no, sorry. So the, the MKO2 expression was at day one uh, or day, well, All right. I think, 36 hours after transduction. Um, yeah. And it's mostly gone by the time we look at BFP, which is at day 10, the MKO2 right. expression is exhausted. So there, there is an integration. Yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you use CAS, if you deliver back uh, CAS9 with bacular virus, you do see very tight, like very few numbers of cells will integrate DNA from the bacular virus at the CAS9 double strand break. Yeah. But... Be using prime editors, we we don't see that problem. And, and there's one other report from another lab that's used prime editors in, in bacular virus. They show that they don't see any increased integration of bacular virus DNA in, at the prime editing site because a prime editor only introduces a nick. It doesn't introduce a double strand break. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions um, from the audience? Okay. I think we've just um, hit our two-hour mark, so I think in the interest of time and um, uh, technical, <laughs> while I've got some bandwidth left, um, I think um, I'd just really like to thank um, our speakers today uh, uh thank the audience for their patience um, and also to thank the um, American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy for co-hosting this event with us and obviously um, organising the platform and the advertising. So we really appreciate it. Um, you know, our society, we're small, but we're, you know, always happy to collaborate. Um, and so please feel free to reach out um, and we'd love to connect in the future. So... With that, again, thank you to the speakers um, and um, I will leave it there. So thank you, everyone. Thank you Thanks. very much.